He is back on the podcast for a third time. Please welcome back Aiden Dodson. The first time we talked about ancient Egypt in general and the second about the pharaohs. And this time we're going to talk about misconceptions about ancient Egypt. We did a similar misconception episode about medieval era with Eleanor Yadiga, which I highly recommend to watch. It's totally fantastic and it's one of the most watched episodes of the podcast. Now, You've been on there before, and of course, let's recap real quickly. How? And just also said you've been to Egypt about 90, 95 times now, I believe, since the last yeah. time. Yeah, I think I'm not sure how many times I've been to Egypt. It must be getting on towards a hundred. I've haven't I've never counted up my um entry stamps in my passports, but it's uh, been a bit a lot anyway. Yeah. So how how did you get into ancient Egypt in the first place? It was it was just something which I got into when I was about seven or eight. Um, I sort of I remember joining the local library for the first time and there were these books with skeletons in them, which is sort of a seven year old is always quite fascinating, which were books on archaeology and sort of almost you know, within a, within a few months. It was purely Egypt I was reading about. It was my sort of passion as a, as a child did it at university. Um, and here I am sort of 50 years later as Professor of Egyptology at Bristol University. So it sort of, it just sort of happened. Mm, right. Um, it, it's, um, what's it like going back to Egypt? Is there always something new every time you go there? Oh, yeah. Um, it's, and I, I love the country anyway. Um, and actually this, this, um, this um, a couple of, a uh, couple of months ago, I actually, we actually went on a cruise from Aswan to Cairo, which I'd not done for something like 30 years. And again, although I've done the journey more than once in the past, the it always feels different. You know, the light, you know, different times of day and things like that. So they just, it's always, just, it's always something, it's always, it always looks and feels different. And also when you're going to archaeological sites, there's often new things which are being opened up to opened up to, to visitors. Um, you know, you, you get to chat to colleagues who have just found something. You know, on this last trip, we went when we were in the Valley of the Kings. One of my one of my um, co- friends and colleagues was working there, so he spent a bit of time talking about his what he was doing there and things like that. So it's so it's, it's always just a nice place to be, and you know, large numbers of friends there as well who it's nice to catch up with. Right, so that's the start of the first misconception. Now, that's perhaps the most elephant in the room here, which is aliens did not build the pyramids, did they? <laughs> not, not in the slightest. I think the problem with these kinds of ideas that st- uh, stupendous works of architecture and art in the past simply couldn't be done by what people call primitive people, mm. but... In fact, technology hasn't really advanced, didn't really start advancing until very, very recently. And nobody ever starts alleging that the great cathedrals of Europe were built by aliens. Um, I think the problem with the whole alien hypothesis, if you can call it that, is actually it's fundamentally a racist idea whereby brown people and black people can't build great, great things. And as there were no white people in Egypt at that particular time, the alien um, hypothesis enthusiasts insist it must have been somebody from outside teaching these, these brown people how to do it or even doing it themselves. So we end up with the idea of aliens building things. Also, those who are slightly less mad uh, may say they are people from Atlantis or from some other sort of legendary um, location. But the bottom Matt line Hancock is... Matt Hancock is really into Atlantis, isn't it? Sorry? Matt, Matt Hancock is really into Atlantis idea. Yes, yes, the, yes. Graham Hancock's current um, Netflix thing is a particularly horrible example of that, um, of this kind of thing. Um, and also what is particularly um, distasteful about people like Graham Hancock and and the other enthusiasts is the way that they insult archaeologists, claiming that we sort of are trying to hide some kind of truth from the from from the masses, um, and and that we that you know, all our decades of of research. Is all is all nonsense, and that that that, thing, that is another side of this whole thing. They, 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 it sort of there's the, you know, the the overall idea that it's somebody else, but then what, when you start going into the implications of that, and the fact that people like me are liars 
and and cheats yeah. all those things are grossly offensive and i th- and i think people who sort of tr- who sort of seem to like the alien or atlantean hypothesis really need to understand what that actually means it means they're fundamentally racists and people and just and and like bad mouthing scientists mm-hmm. That is really the important thing they need to recognise what this sort of apparently sort of cuddly and quite sort of and fun idea of aliens building pyramids really all is all about. You, you just, actually, when, sorry, sorry for yeah. disturbing you, but I just want well, I just want to say you remind me that's kind of similar thing with the Great Zimbabwe that has been neglected mm-hmm. for years that Africans could not have built this. This must have been this that that should not be possible, you know. That's yeah. It kind of reminds me of the Great Zimbabwe. Oh yeah, I think it's, 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 it's another aspect of the same thing. Because then, of course, they bring in the Queen of Sheba and all those sorts of things into these ideas about about Great Zimbabwe, and, and so I think that's it's important to recognise what these sort of fringe lunatic um, ideas really are all about. And they're, so they're fundamentally fundamentally wrong. And as we're sort of on say lighter note, you know, people who accuse us archaeologists of having sort of conspired to hide the truth. Clearly has never met an archaeologist. We're the most con- most uh, argumentative bunch of people on earth. We can't even agree on little details of Egyptian history, let alone agree what great conspiracy to put together to hide the, the fact that the aliens built the pyramids or they were built by Atlanteans or any sort of uh, outsiders from that. You know, that's, that's just not the way... You know, the, the the lack if you go to a conference of archaeologists the lack of agreement on almost everything makes it completely impossible that we could ever be sort of gang up and try and come up with some kind of conspiracy we'd be, we'd spend another 10 years trying to work out which conspiracy we should be going with rather than anything else so um you now it's a whole there, there are so many aspects to these sort of the 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 ancient astronauts um um arguments yeah. um and it, it's it's it, it is really really very very annoying in the way that it distracts people from actually understanding what the, the realities are of of um of these things the only upside i suppose it does actually make some people interested in the ancient world and then some of them may re- may sort of see the the error of their ways and go over to the what you might call the, the, the from the dark side to the light side and in fact there is one particular um egyptologist who again um was originally sucked in by some of the sort of more wacko side of things but then he saw he saw the light went off got a phd and um is now a leading a leading leading archaeologist so there there is an upside to to the whole this whole thing but it is you know when people like Graham Hancock can get sort of six episode series to spout their rubbish, um, whereas just trying to get you know, just anything more mainstream on TV um, is really is really difficult. And the number of times I've been involved in the in the development of what would be a really really good program or even sort of short series, but then the money isn't made available because it's not sexy enough. Yeah, that's a, that's it's all about sexiness, isn't it? So they're going to keep, to keep talking about the pyramids for a wee bit longer, and I want to tell about another misconception, and this is, of course, as probably a Hollywood fantasy, that the, the pyramids weren't really booby traps, were they? Yeah, well, it's interesting about sort of the, the whole idea that pyramids had booby traps, or, gym, or tombs in general do. They don't have booby traps in the sense of things which, like, trip wires and things to sort of to bring things down on, on people. But over time, there was an increasingly sophisticated set of security arrangements, more to do with the way if you seal to seal the thing up, because the earliest pyramids effectively it's just a straightforward um, passageway from the entrance on the north side down to the burial chamber. So even those very, very earliest ones do often have a portcullis involved. So a block of stone can be um, l- lowered down through a shaft from the surface to actually block the passageway. And what then happens over the generations of pyramid building is that they make that more elaborate. So rather than having one portcullis, you have two portcullises or three portcullises. Then having experienced the fact that 
pyramids are being robbed by tomb robbers. The next step is to get away from always having the entrance on the north side, because that was a dead giveaway. So therefore, about a thousand years on in pyramid building, they move the entrance to other locations. And then the next thing is you start having much more elaborate ways of sealing of sealing chambers. So rather than just simply a portcullis slid from above, you'll sometimes have almost hydraulics run by sand, which allow whole chamber roofs to be lowered after the burial. So that rather than simply breaking through it, there's no doorway. You've got this four or five foot thick ceiling and walls to try and get through as well. And those sort of things, you know, have are quite are quite elaborate. But those are all triggered by the funeral party, who are then, who they who then leave, rather than the robbers themselves. Um, though there is actually a quite a nice, a completely ex uh, um, um, accidental situation of robbers bringing down death on themselves, is that there was a a tomb was found back about hundred years ago, and they'd found and the archaeologists found that the ceiling had collapsed. And when they cleared the ceiling, they then found the skeleton of a, of a tomb robber squashed on top of the coffin. Because clearly when the, when the tomb had been opened, the change in the atmosphere had, had caused some, some of the rock to crumble. Mm. And it came down smack on top of the tomb robber. So that sort of is the nearest thing, but that's more, that's more a natural booby trap rather than a real one. And then set up like pits with snakes in under. Not the slightest. Or... No, the, 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 you do have pits, but again, they're not to fall down because they're too obvious. What they are there for is to stop people getting through the next onto the next over to the other side. Mm. And of course, things like you know the snakes wouldn't live very long. Yeah, that's um, fair. so. So basically, also what you're trying to do is simply either make it almost impossible for the robber to to proceed. You no. Know, shafts great blocks of stone and occasionally in some of the very very last pyramids to be built they even have dummy passageways to mislead the, the robber as to where he should go and there is one pyramid almost one of the last great pyramids to be constructed albeit never finished which even got a, a dummy burial chamber in it the there's this burial there's one burial chamber which is very obvious and clearly was never it wasn't in tech wasn't the real one and the real one was sort of embedded deeply in the rock and uh to try uh, with the rock what the robbers being distracted mm -hmm. so they certainly do go towards the end some really really elaborate kinds of of ways of protecting but it's always to do with stopping people getting there rather than doing nasty things to them while they're on the on the on route so, so, so i read somewhere i don't in the magazine i think where they the robbers, when they were stopped by stones in the way that were like said, were pushed down, they just dig themselves above the stones. Oh yeah, then... this is this is half the problem. Yes, you're quite right. That that what the, the, the normally pyramid passageways are cut milt of fairly soft limestone, and of course again they may well put a big granite portcullis in the way, but of course all you can then do is just is just chisel round the outside of it and get past so a lot of it i think is not to stop them completely they know that that's maybe impossible what the hope is to do is to slow them down sufficiently so the police can get there and catch them the problem which is fine in periods where you haven't got a corrupt police force and things like that but it seems like it seems that most of the major tomb robbery takes place when there's some kind of civil war going on or or some kind of revolution when the police are no longer in place or the police are corrupt and can be paid and they're being paid by the tomb robbers. So, um, but I think the, the whole thing is more to try, try to do with delaying rather than absolutely stopping them. Because if you can't, if, if the tomb robbers got long enough, he is pretty, you know, he will manage to find the way in eventually. And that's, that's, that's true. Even in the most elaborately protected pyramids, they've all been robbed because eventually the robber could spend you know, a month or whatever chipping through granite or quartzite if necessary to get to the burial chamber. And um, there's one last thing about the pyramids I want to talk about before we move away from them, and that is that the pharaohs did not bury, and there was no slaves who did build them, and, and they did not I believe it is justice in the second episode, which is almost two years ago now. 
Um, they, but they did, did not kill their workers of the pyramids to hide where the tomb really was. Not in the slightest. That the the pyramids and later on the the tombs and value of the kings were all built by skilled labourers, and certainly there would be no desire to you know to put the death or anything like that because their expertise is needed for the next um, pharaoh. The idea, the, the question about using slave slaves for pyramid building is an interesting one because it partly depends on how you define slaves. Certainly, pyramids were never were not built by slaves in the sense of people who are permanently subjugated um you know and, and, and forced to work however it's likely that during the time when the nile flood took place um when the fields were covered with water that the farmers who are no longer able to work on the fields may well have been conscripted to do some laboring um you know, dragging dragging blocks and so on just up to the building site where the skilled laborers could pick up on their on on the on on, on what they on that, what they were doing whether you could call that slavery or simply compulsory labor um it's a different you know it's a bit it's the it's the sort of bit the subtlety there uh, because many many sort of societies have situations where people where members of the members of the population are obliged to do public service at some point or other so I think the nearest you're going to get to what the sort of Hollywood sees as slaves doing it is when you've got people who are normally farmers being brought in to do some heavy lifting and heavy dragging uh, during the inundation um, season. And, and also the reason that's also when you're going to need that kind of unskilled dragging labour, because it's during the inundation when the when the water of the Nile comes right up to the edge of the desert, is when you can actually bring in stones and other things from outside the building site, because the majority of um, of the stone for building pyramids is quarried directly at the at the pyramid site within a few hundred meters or so. But there are the more exotic stones, like the better quality limestone used for the, um, the casing, which has to be brought from the other side of the Nile. Uh, then you've also got things like granite, quartzite, and things which come from other parts of Egypt. So that's when you're bringing all that stuff over on rafts and boats. And then you're going to, and that's when you need the extra labour. And it's probably worthwhile noting that in, in a couple of years ago, um, the logbooks of one of the people who ran one of the ships delivering these blocks from across the river was discovered. We have actually got the actual logbook of somebody who was in, intimately involved in building the Great Pyramid by bringing the casing blocks over from the other side of the Nile. That's um, amazing. Yeah, though that's they were actually they weren't they were interesting. These papyri, which are actually the oldest papyri known from Egypt, were actually found on the Red Sea coast because the the, the ship's captain also worked running boats on the Red Sea as well. So clearly his office was over there, and that when eventually you know they, they got they got rid of the old log books, they were left on the Red Sea coast. So it's quite remarkable how a discovery you know, many many miles from the pyramid sites actually brings us right face to face and that's of course another thing which one can throw at the um, alien and whatever um, protagonists is we've actually got now a piece of pieces of papyrus written by people who are building pyramids hmm. or involved, were involved in the supply chain of building pyramids so it's um you know that, that these are we we have more we more have more than adequate evidence as to who is building pyramids and why and everything else, uh, all of which tend to be completely sort of ignored by um by by the aliens and Atlantean um, people. And I have to rec recommend the book. It's called the Red Sea Scrolls, which was published a few months ago. So it's a bit of a pun on the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the Red Sea Scrolls. Are published by Thames and Hudson, which I think is a should be compulsory reading for anybody who vaguely wants to get involved in the ancient aliens um, hypothesis, because it, this absolutely um, nails Ludicrous. exactly who was building the pyramids and why and everything else. Right. Yeah, and uh, let's move away from the pyramids uh, because one one of the most fam infamous and uh, misconception that has been for the past two thousand years, I think, now that this 
Egyptians did not enslave the Israelites. So, well, <laughs> how come that ended up in the Bible, and why has the put on the, the Egyptians kind of bad? And so, again, is this kind of like a racist thing, or is it like uh... well, the trouble? The, the, well, the thing is that mm, well, I'm not sure. It, I, it is possible they did enslave the, the Israelites. However, the evidence for such only comes from the Bible in the sense that that is how the Israelites present themselves to poster themselves to posterity. There's a, there's certainly no evidence from Egypt itself that the Israelites ever existed. The idea that foreigners like the Israelites might have been enslaved um, is it's not unreasonable. Certainly if they were ever, if they were kept if they had been captured in uh, in warfare, we they cert we certainly know that the Egyptians enslaved prisoners of war, or again made them do for forced labour anyway. Um, but there's fact so the but the idea of simply an ethnic group would suddenly be enslaved by on on a whim. There's certainly no pa no obvious parallel to that, as far as one can see. Uh, the Egyptians' views on resident a uh, resident foreigners was that they were simply you know that they were they were the members of the, the of the population and they were let get on with things so the the sort of scenario which the bible presents regarding the israelites is unlikely there's also say the, the big question because the um the whole thing only comes from the from the bible so they say there's no objective data from the egyptian side is that the whole thing may well be a spit. The whole biblical um, account may be a spin doctor's um, version of something which we do know happened, which was when the Hyksos, a bunch of Palestinian um, rulers, um, oppressed Egypt for a hundred years and then were expelled. Now it's it's quite possible. Um, one 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 theory is that the amongst the Hyksos were the people who later became the Israelites, and the it, and rather than being the ones who were being oppressed by the Egyptians, they were the ones who oppressed the Egyptians, and were thrown out by the Egyptians because the Egyptians got fed up with being oppressed by the Israelites and their and their Hyksos friends. And this would be, a, and this is a sort of thing which you tend to know. You can you find when you look at sort of propagandistic um, accounts of things that you know you wouldn't. If you think about when the the biblical stories are being developed, probably around campfires, public readings, and so on, in the sort of a thousand years between the events they purport to um, describe and when they're actually written down, about five hundred BC, is are they going to say? You know, when you're asked, well, why did e why did you leave Egypt? You're not going to say, well, we'd been um, oppressing the Egyptians for a century and they got fed up with us and threw mm -hmm. us out. They're going to try and turn the whole thing around in a more propagandizing way. So I think if the whole Israelite episode actually happened at all, I think it was more likely to have been the other way around. They were part of a Palestinian group who were oppressing the Egyptians and they were expelled. The fact that they had been in Egypt for a period of time and then had been and had left was clearly something which was part of the their sort of um, their, their their whole um, popular myth. Um, but of course, they had to make it more favourable mm. to themselves. So I think it, so you, you do tend to find that the people who are doing bad things or have done bad things will always try and explain it away. Um, just look at sort of. Um, um, Putin in Ukraine. He's claiming that he's trying to defend Russia by invading the next door, his next door neighbour. So that, that, those, those that, is that, that that's is that, I think it's exactly that kind of thing which we felt is probably to be found. Why the the Bible tells it one way when one has a strong suspicion it was the other way around completely. You need a sympathy, right? You need a sympathy for from the people. Yeah. Yeah, but but also you always. But I think always um, when in any kind of national history writing. You normally try and present yourself in the best possible light, and, and 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 if you think about the way that sort of history has been written over the last couple of centuries, it's only very recently that former colonial powers, for example, have started to admit that what they were doing was not necessarily as altruistic as it was always presented at the time. And it was always, uh, um, 
I mean, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I can add an excellent book on that topic, when you mentioned that that colonials, on the colonialism Pierce Brennan's book on the decline and fall of Anjin, of not sorry, not Anjin, but uh, his Pierce Brennan's book on the decline and fall of British Empire. That's an excellent example of that of how uncovering the truth, if you will, on the British Empire. Oh, but sorry, yeah, and I think true with, with the other empires as well. It's always, you know, you always want to make, to make your own story sound better, and it's it takes quite a bit of time and also courage to start being able to admit that things were not as good as the propaganda used to put out. On the other hand, there is always a danger of going too far as well in the other direction. Then the 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 the, 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 the objective history is something very very difficult to write when particularly you are from a culture or the culture whose history you're writing. It's always just slightly easier to do it do it for as an outsider, doing it as an insider. And given how important the whole the whole um, the whole um, sort of creation myth of Israel is. One can see why that their that their that object, objectivity doesn't really have a place in that. Right, and I'm not in the add this to this, but I want to add it anyway. And uh, I ha- had Irving Finkel on in the, in the summer, and he said we discussed about James and antiquity, and we came across uh, early writings like uh, you know Rosetta Stone, for example. But he claims, and I'm not sure if you agree with him on this, but he claims that the pharaohs and the hieroglyphs were not the first writing, that the Babylonians were the first writing. Is there, do you agree with that? Or do you... yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those little, it's one of those little, little battles that the us and the Mesopotamian specialists have been having over the years. Who actually is the earlier? I think I would agree that probably Mesopotamia, Babylonia. Is the uh, has got these got the earliest surviving examples of real writing. Um, the the earliest Egyptian evidence is probably two or three hundred years later. So I would I would probably agree that probably the Mesopotamians were the first people to have a meaningful writing system, and the Egyptians developed theirs quite possibly because they knew of what was going on in Mesopotamia. Mm-hmm. It's also worth you know, it's worth noting that the very earliest Mesopotamian signs before they moved into the cuneiform the, the cunea where we're familiar with for most of Mesopotamian history, was 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 using pictures as the basis for their various syllables. And, and those they were not be- emojis. Hmm? They were not emojis. No, they were, but they, but they but they said so they had their they, they their the very earliest writing in Mesopotamia is based on a picture based script, yeah. which then becomes then sort of becomes very much uh, then turned into high into cuneiform. So my suspicion is what happened was, because we know there is lots of trade going on between Iraq and Egypt and stuff going on at this period, is that traders and sort of other visitors from Egypt came back to Egypt saying, hey, over in Mesopotamia, they've got this way of writing. So therefore, hieroglyph, the hieroglyphic script is developed not in any way as a copy as such, but merely because they know that the people, that, that that's what's possible in Mesopotamia. And therefore, I think, therefore, that the Egyptians then start, take the same idea of using pictures for sounds, but then develop completely separately. So I think, but I think, I think, I think, I think Irving is quite right that the earliest, the earliest writing we have any knowledge of is Mesopotamian. It's a couple of years earlier, a couple of hundred years earlier. So I think it is where it all comes from. And that's where the inspiration for Egyptian hieroglyphs um, comes from. But so it's not, I don't, it's, it's no, I don't think a direct borrowing because the actual way that you the, the, the signs work is totally different. But the idea, and I think that's, I guess, often the important thing when you look at how um, things develop around the world, is that it's often not a question of actually directly copying something. It's just getting an, a being aware that some you can do that sort of thing. And that is sort of where, where, it, where it comes from. I mean, just look at the Greece for stuff, and then you Etruscan birth from the Greece, and the Romans birth from oh, yeah. the Etruscans, yeah. and then you got the modern alphabet that way, you know, so you see, I, I can yeah. see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's often it's, it's often just the idea, and actually in very late, there's a, there are is actually an alphabetic cuneiform, which is done shortly before you start getting Phoenician writing, which is mm. where all art, where, the, where sort of modern Western stuff originates. Um, 
you know so 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 there i think there's the the the, the there's an, an an idea that you can go down the purely alphabetic route because of course the various uh, um, languages written in cuneiform and also in hieroglyphs they're not purely alphabetic there's is there's a mixture of a mixture of types of sound signs the big the big leap was only having alphabetic signs and what's interesting there is that as those come in in phoenicia at around the same sort of time people are trying to turn there's, there there's, there are attempts to make to use to have a cuneiform alphabetic approach as well um so again i think ideas move but exactly how you implement those 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 ideas um can vary from place to place right and that's brings us to the next misconception, and that is we discussed this. Actually, I got the idea for this. We kind of discussed this already in the, our episode on the pharaohs. That you said that the pharaohs weren't really called pharaohs. That's more a modern invention. Um, sort of, because there is an Egyptian basis to it. The thing is, the term pharaoh we we take directly from the Bible, and in fact, the Bible seems to think that the fa- the word pharaoh is actually a name. Because it talks about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, not on the Pharaoh of Egypt, um, and that says passed into the English language. And effectively, the word Pharaoh has ceased to be anything other than simply a word meaning a king of Egypt. Um, it does actually have an Egyptian backdrop, however, but not until about fifteen hundred or fourteen hundred BC, because at that point you start seeing. Um, a, a, a word per a'a, which is certainly the same word as pharaoh, um, appearing as a designation of the, of the royal palace. And then, a few hundred years later, we start seeing per a'a being used as the title for a king. So you actually have pharaoh so-and-so um, later on. So that seems to have been a development of what was originally simply a statement for the palace to be a title and the idea of using sort of the, the word sort of a palace for a person is rather like in the usa you say that the white house said so and so which of course means the president said something or in the uk um the, the number 10 downing street said x mm-hmm. uh, which of course means the prime minister of the united kingdom said some said so on and i think there's, there's also there are parallels in other um in other sense, like for example, um, the sublime port or the or the or the beautiful door became a term for the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, mm. the sublime port. So this the, this idea of the place and the person who lives in it becoming sort of coming together. So yeah, you the the the, the concept of using per a'a or pharaoh as a designation for the king or at least the king's ship probably say 1400, 1300 or so BC, but for the first half before that, not at all. So it is a bit of an anachronism if you talk about the pharaohs who built the pyramids because the pyramids were built at a time when per a'a was never used. On the other hand, though, I think because the the word pharaoh is now an English word and a German word and a Norwegian word and anybody else, because it's, it's been brought in, I think one can be a little... One can't doesn't have to be too sort of purist about it, right. because I because I, I wrote a book on the first pharaohs. We go you know, a few uh, a couple of years ago, and I actually had to made a point in the introduction to say that I'm using the word pharaoh as the English word meaning Egyptian king, rather than alleging that these people actually had the title. Because there are certain colleagues and reviewers who get themselves remarkably worked up over stuff like that. Um, so say so pharaoh. Yeah, the Egyptians did use it, but not until pretty late on in their in their history. Do you have an academic title for a pharaoh that mostly academics use? Not right. I think we should call them kings, king or pharaoh, quite honestly. Um, because the Egyptians themselves they had a, ter- a word which was Nesu, which meant the you know, the ruler the, the ruler, um, which we trendly translate as king. Um there are probably a lot more subtleties involved in the various words which the Egyptians use for king, because there's more than one. Um, but unfortunately, but of course, with when you're looking at a, a dead language, one can't necessarily get the um, get the the subtleties. And also, we then 
are forced to come up with English translations for some of those titles, which, because we don't quite know what the um, difference is, you know, what, what the subtlety is, whether our, ty- our translation is useful or not. So for Nessu, we say, uh, which is, ta- um, we say king. There's also another word for the king, Iti, uh, which we translate as sovereign. Not because it means the same as the English word sovereign. It's simply because it's a different word for the concept of kingship. And it brings a big, a, a huge, a huge area of discussion when you're talking about I don't know, myths about ancient Egypt or misconceptions and so on. Some of them are derived... It's, it's a feel of our itself, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of other misconceptions because people read um, an English translation of Egyptian text where certain words have been used mm-hmm. to mean a certain thing, or used for a certain thing. But it doesn't necessarily mean they mean the same thing as in English. Uh, the, the, and, the and again, one... sorry for interrupting you again, but I no. want to compare that it start reading Caesar's Gallic War in English and not in Latin, right? Or reading Herodotus in Yeah, oh absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and the best example is that we is that we use the word harem mm. for two completely different words in ancient Egyptian. And in neither case do they mean harem in the sort of sexual Ottoman way. sense. One of them means is 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 a is a word which seems to mean some accommodation for the royal family, not just simply women. And the other actually is a troop of musicians. Hmm. That has um, nothing to do with the uh, slave uh, just yeah. being used for the pharaoh's pleasure at all. Yeah, not exactly. So the problem is that those words have been picked because you need an English word and people prefer to translate with a single word rather than a whole phrase. Mm. But also people then, again, if they don't read read ancient Egyptian, will think that these two, that, that the har, these two harems are the same thing mm. as well. So I'm getting involved in a long discussion on Facebook, and I know one shouldn't do all such things, you know, about this, somebody was arguing something, but said, hang on a second, which har, word for harem, which word which you translate as harem are you talking about? And it turned out they hadn't realised they were two separate words, and therefore they were arguing something completely impossible, because they didn't know which of these words it is. And there's, 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 other, there's, there's, there's always a big problem with any kind of, of, of translations you know, between, between languages, you know, uh, between English and Norwegian, I'm sure there's lots of places yeah. where there isn't actually a one-for-one correlation between yeah. the two, and, you know, and I know from other languages, other languages I do know, it's you have that there's a, there's a, there's that very much that problem. So it's a bit it's, an, it's another thing which sort of stokes myths about ancient Egypt or misunderstandings about ancient Egypt, is that people don't appreciate actually what the Egyptians are actually saying themselves, what some of the words actually mean, uh, rather than. Um, so I think I'm always very nervous when, uh, certainly in the UK, there's a drive to really sort of to allow people to study ancient Egyptian texts without actually learning any ancient Egyptian itself. Mm-hmm. They're simply learning it from from, from from learning about stuff from translations, and I think that's very very dangerous because you've got unless you understand the subtleties as to why a word may or may not be appropriate, um, and also whether or not certain you know, cons- grammatical construction incorrectly, you know, d- um, put together. I, mean, I, I want to kind of try to argue that, though with you because I think it's kind of a good thing that people want to learn this original, uh, read this original text, and you, you, not everyone may have time to, you know. Oh, I learn, know. Like, ancient the Egyptians, and they have to rely on these translations. Oh, I, I agree completely. But it, it, I'm really, I'm not talking about just people who just ordinary people who are interested. I think you talk about from the point of view of stu- people sort of st- you know, serious students. There are people who will study Egyptian texts at university without actually having ever learnt any ancient Egyptian, and I think that's dangerous. But no, of course you've got to have you know the, 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 these translations. But also people have got to understand the limitations of them. That the, the, the translations say as much about the person who translated the text as the person who actually wrote it in you know, three, four thousand years previously. That there's there's always going to, that when you make a choice, when you're translating something, there's always a choice about what words you use. And those are very much modern choices rather than reflecting, you know, which, which can impact uh, what the, the tone of the text and everything else. 
Mm. Right. We have a few more myths to travel before we go, and uh, one of them is, uh, we, I believe we discussed this in the first episode, you were on the second episode of the podcast as well, is that Tutankhamun was not really a big deal, was it? Um, Tutankhamun, whether he's a big deal or not, it very much depends where you're coming from. There's a, that, Certainly there's a little bit a lot of hyperbole about the tomb being the greatest discovery ever made. Which, I mean, in the in the rural sense, when he was uh, yeah, know. yeah, I know. I'm just thinking about them just bringing yeah. that in as well. There's a lot of hyperbole about about sort of the fact the fact there's lots lots of lots of gold and stuff. As far as Tutankhamun himself is concerned, he is important in the sense of where he fits in history, hmm. because he is the person under whom the dismantling of the that the whole religious revolution of Akhenaten takes place. But of course, as um, a child for much of his reign, he probably didn't have a huge amount of input into that. Mm. On the other hand, though, probably once he was sort of from from his mid-teens onwards, he may well have done. But we, so it's very much unclear how much of the import, very important stuff which happens during his reign is due to him and how much is down to his advisors, the people who are acting as regent for him. So the reign is really important, but the importance of him is very difficult to to grasp. But on the other hand, if you look at sort of more recent history, being a teenager doesn't necessarily mean you're not influential. For example, um, Edward VI of of England, the son of Henry VIII, he was had a very he was he died when he was I think again about the same sort of age as Tutankhamun yeah. or even or even younger. Yet we know he had a very strong influence on the hardline Protestantism, which was introduced during his reign. And he because he was he was only a teenager doing that. So because somebody is a young is a young ruler who may not who may have nominally somebody ruling on behalf of them doesn't mean they're not important. So I think with Tutankhamun, his reign is important. But whether he is important is a much more difficult thing to grant, get hold of. But but I want to say though, it seems that he had pretty good re- regions then, which is kind of rare, isn't it? Because most it seems to me that and quite a lot of regions want just power for themselves and for their own gain and power and stay in power. But it seems like he had actually decent regions if he did. It is an important reign. Yeah. Well, again, again, we don't really under it, Reno, because the point is that the, all we know is that what happens is the dismantling of Akhenaten's revolution, basically. Mm-hmm. Now, the question is whether that is being done for, yeah, you know, whether whether that is being done for reasons which the young king would approve of, whether they're being done for again, for, you know, for, for settling personal scores and so on. It's very difficult to know. So uh, the. So I don't, I'm not sure you can say that, the, that he had good regents. All we can say is what actually happened, because we just we haven't got any kind of data to understand whether or how they what they were motivated by, and sort of how you know, whether they were indeed good. Because again, as we were oh, talking yeah. earlier on about sort of when people re- re- want to present stuff, they always want to show themselves in the in the best light. And as one of his regents then went on to be kept be pharaoh for a couple of decades, again. Officially, what officially what happened during that time was a good thing because that's what the pharaoh says. So I'm not sure we can necessarily necessarily say that. That's fair. Yeah. Of course, I have one last myth, and this one's more fun one. Of course, mummies does not come back to life. <laughs> no, there's not very much. Basically, there's not really enough, enough enough left of a mummy to be able to do that. Bear in mind that the you know, the mummy is a dried out husk of a of a of a body with most of its organs missing um, and unable to and, and rather and rather on the stiff side. It, it's amazing how much of what people think they know about um, Egypt is all to do with um, you know what what Hollywood Hollywood says to them. You know, and in fact, quite a few of the sort of misconceptions we've been talking about um, are ultimately stoked by by the Hollywood position. Yeah. You know, the idea of slave or of slaves and all those kinds of things is you know is is pandered to by 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 Hollywood. Um, 
And again, the sort of the idea of mummies as being malevolent beings and all those sorts of things. It's also interesting, actually, that when you that the the idea of you know, when you've got sort of you know, in the in sort of fantasy kinds of things to do with mummies, it things sort of change in the 1930s to between malevolent mummies. If you actually read some of the literature about mummies, you know, fantasies about mummies written prior to that, they were normally sort of much more um, much more sort of friendly creatures. Um, so there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a whole interesting thing about the way that the mummy moves from being a possibly not exactly a cuddly thing for in in literature to being a much more malevolent kind of of thing as well. And also, of course, this ties in with the myth with the myth myths of um, Egyptian curses and so on. That you know any the, the curses which do exist are more to do with people who are going to who are trying to embezzle. Um, embezzle money from funerary um endowments rather than anything to do with sort of you know calling vengeance on anybody who may um who might uh, violate the tomb i mean you do have the famous curse of tutankhamun well, which of course doesn't exist the, the, the curse of tutankhamun was made up by by a journalist what a surprise journalists make stuff up yeah it was it was a, it was um, and we, we're not sure who made it up. We were, there's a there's a strong um, suspicion it may have been a guy called Arthur Weigel, who had been an Egyptologist, had moved on to uh, theatre set designing and novel writing, but then was hired by a British newspaper to cover the um, the whole thing, and he was good at sort of spinning yarns. And I think what happened was that when Lord Carnarvon died of blood poisoning following a, a mosquito bite that he was probably telling tall tales to his journalistic colleagues, uh, which then sort of became more and more serious. And the, and the most amusing thing about this is that when poor old Weigel died of cancer 10 years later, um, the newspapers accused the, the, the curse of Tadakamun of killing him when he probably made it up himself. So quite interesting, quite fun how all these things happen. It's always a joy to have you back in the podcast. And you're, of course, always welcome back again in the future. Before we go, do you have anything you want to promote? Any social media, Twitter? Um, well, just to, just to, to just to say that my book on Tutankhamun, Tutankhamun, King of Egypt, his life and afterlife, came out a few weeks ago, and I have a book which should be out in about 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 10, 10, 12 months, 10, 11 months time, are the Nubian pharaohs of Egypt, their lives and afterlives in a series, which I'm now on something like my one, two, three, four, five, my, my sixth, my sixth um, volume in this particular series of lives and afterlives. Sounds exciting. I'm make sure to look it up. And uh, this has been one that aged well. We are available on Twitter, I don't know what that age 12, Instagram, what that age 12. You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you can find podcasts these days. If you are on iTunes, please make sure to write a re review if you liked our episode. And also, we made another Mystery Inception episode about the medieval era with Dr. Eleanor Yanagra, which I highly recommend checking out. And also check out other episodes as well. This has been what that age 12. Please like, share and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Right.